how much of the harm that we are seeing from COVID-19, if we tomorrow were to address um, vitamin D deficiency, and we were to get as serious as possible about alerting people to the problem, alerting people to their special vulnerabilities if they have dark skin or they spend a lot of time indoors, whatever their vulnerabilities may be, and we were to start distributing vitamin D with the kind of aggressiveness that we are currently pushing vaccines, how much of the harm of COVID-19 could be reduced? I'll answer first, because I've, I've given this a lot of thought and even written articles about it, and the answer is all of it. So even um, different, there have been lots of papers estimating what percentage of deaths could be prevented, and they vary between 80% and 100%, depending on uh, the approach used. There's a recent paper that targeted 50 nanograms per milliliter that suggested that if we could get everybody to that level, uh, we'd go down to zero deaths. But I look at it from a slightly different perspective as a physicist, um, particularly with an understanding of exponential processes. And uh, this is a double exponential process uh, in, a, in a pandemic because you've got the exponential process of viral replication within the body, and then you've got the exponential process at the method, sort of macro level of spreading through the community. And um, in any exponential process, if you can uh, add a prophylactic that lowers the transmission rate, so lowers R effectively, which everybody's now familiar with, uh, which is nice. If you can push R below zero, uh, which is pretty easy to do, even if you reduce R um, by a small amount, it has a very big impact in terms of the end number uh, when you're dealing with exponential processes. And the, the effect of vitamin D is so strong <clears throat> that you would wipe out the pandemic if everybody was sufficient because there wouldn't be enough people. It's a bit like if you have, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm taking a drink of water to explain this bit. Mm -hmm. If you have <clears throat> a dry fire, Linda and I like to talk about dry uh, embers and tinder. Uh, um, uh, dry ash. tinder in. in exactly. In, yeah. it's, it's a very good analogy. If you've got a, a fire uh, or rather a fire that's about to be made of dry tinder blocks that are all stacked together, um, you've got different strategies you can use to stop that from catching fire. One is to move all the blocks apart, social distancing, uh, or you can spray the wood uh, so to keep it damp and, it, and then the fire doesn't catch. And vitamin D is basically like just keeping the wood damp so that the fire doesn't catch. So even if there's a bit burning somewhere, if as long as you can get most people to a, a healthy level of green, where the wood is green, then the fire just goes out naturally. So um, uh, I believe I understood your explanation the following way. You have two exponential processes, viral replication inside the body, which is going to be a correlate of how sick you get, and you've got the exponential process involved in the spread. And the point is vitamin D works in both ways. It causes the spread to be greatly reduced and it causes the degree of sickness to be reduced in individuals. And the combination exactly. of both of these reductions is enough to bring uh, R sufficiently below one that it will eventually go extinct. Yeah. And that's what normally happens in, season, in, in, in summer, the effects, the combined effects of UV destroying viruses in, in the air, plus the in, improved host response drives are well below uh, that value. And then it dies out until winter starts. And then there's always a pool of uh, viruses somewhere because, you know, it's, it's zoonotic and it's in, it's in different animals. And we don't know really which species it, it crosses because the studies that look at zoonotic transmission are based on lab animals and their host response is completely different to wild animals or animals in a food market in China. You know, you, just, you really need to look at different populations to understand that. Well, that's a uh, very terrifying scenario that you paint, um, you know. Well, it's also why the vaccine program is dangerous. And, and, and you know, I'm not, you know, Linda and I are both pro-vaccines in general, as are you. Um, yep. We've taken every vaccine under the sun and we'll continue to do so as long as we believe. Taking vaccines against diseases most people have never yeah. heard of. Just vaccinated <laughs> my dog a few weeks ago. 
But the reason the programme for zoonotic diseases, like or any respiratory disease which easily transmits uh, between species, the human population represents 10% of the total reservoir because it's in wild animals, it's in food markets, in chickens, in kept pigs, we have swine flu, we've had bird flu. Um, and you can't, you're not going to immunise all of those animals as well. So uh, I've heard doctors arguing that we need to get to 90% because that means that it's totally controlled. But if you then do, you know, do multiply with that by 0.1, because we're only 10% of the total population, you see the fallacy of, of, of that argument. We're never going to wipe it out that way. The only way we're going to get rid of it is if we get our, um, our host response healthy. And the way to do that is through uh, good nutrition, lifestyle, um, and not, you know, not depending on solutions that are expensive that don't really work or that have a limited life because evolution is very clever at getting around uh, whatever technology we create to stop it. Well, again, I, I think this is a very terrifying scenario. I mean, if you were, let's say, in the pharmaceutical industry and you were depending on this new market to continue to allow you to, I don't know, uh, pay the mortgage on your new boat or whatever it is that's driving this. But right. um, but yes, for the rest of us, it's a very delightful prospect that we actually right. might have the tools at our disposal to at least drive this down to a level where it is um, extremely well managed the way we could say of something like plague or rabies in the first world where we never encounter these things. Um, but driving it extinct would be uh, even more delightful. So it well, we're driving it back. I mean, you know, we have coronaviruses all the time, and most of them are completely innocuous. People get them and don't even realise. This one, obviously, everybody is is treating as if it's something that's always fatal, and that just isn't the case. Of course, it kills people with comorbidities very easily, and we believe that's because they're vitamin D deficient. It's not the only reason. Uh, I, I think of it as the, the sort of um, the breastplate of immunity. You know, you can have other chinks in your armor that go missing for whatever reason, but if the breastplate's missing, you're wide open, you know? And it's just like, just get that in place, and make sure that's protected, uh, and you'll probably be okay. Now, this virus is not going to go extinct. And this is one of the frustrating things that I've seen with the public health response is that they keep on promising the public, if you do this, if you do that, if you do that, COVID-19 will go away as if the fact that we are more virtuous as a society somehow influences what this virus is going to do. The virus does not care about whether or not you care about your neighbors or not. The, the virus just does what viruses do. And this particular virus has been found in many animals, including wild animals. Anytime, as soon as you discover that a virus is also has a animal reservoir, you know it will never be extinct. Smallpox yeah. had no animal reservoir, and that is why we could drive it to be extinct. So, so polio uh, has no animal reservoir. Yellow I, fever I, has I, animal I, reservoir; it'll never be extinct. So, I I want to I want to ask you about this because I've been tracking this uh, pretty carefully, and I'm very cautious about saying we can't drive it extinct because, although that is quite possible, I don't know of the piece of evidence that tells us that. Now, it sounds to me like you're drawing a very clear line at if animal reservoir then extinction is impossible. But um, the animal reservoir you must be pointing to is white-tailed deer? No, there are. That, that's the problem, is there are multiple wild animals. Now, hold animal on. You may, you, may, you may be telling me something I don't know. But okay. uh, as far as I understand it, we have seen this virus uh, move between minks and yes. ferrets. But mm -hmm. these are domestic populations. There is a single Wild. case, as far as I know, of a mink that has shown that it has contracted uh, SARS-CoV-2, but it was a mink in close proximity to a domestic population. Um, Is there that are in many Utah? Because in Utah, they have minks too. Uh, multiple so minks. May, no, you may, you may be telling me something that's more up to date than I know. Right. Are you in telling Denmark, me it was a mink? It was a mink farm. Mink farm. Yep. But, you've, you've but seen in that. Utah, there were wild minks that had uh, SARS-CoV-2. More than one. Yes, and once okay. you get it into a wild population, it can go anywhere. 
And well, you cannot possibly immunize wild every wild animal. And also, we haven't tested all the animals. So there are too many to test. So we only have a very limited view of what's actually happening in the real world. Right. But my, my point would be, we don't need to drive it extinct. We need to make sure that it's not a threat. And it can be, if it can be shrunk down into something that's no longer scary and terrifying and doesn't make people ill and, and doesn't do the rounds every year, which is absolutely possible, um, then uh, we won't need to worry about it anymore. Sure, I, I agree with this completely. I mean, at the level that we've got plague controlled, uh, I think we could all well, breathe pretty easy. Influenza, for example. We, we deal with influenza every year, and I think people probably don't realize we've, we've been vaccinating against influenza since 1945. To what end? I don't, that hasn't made a single dent in what happens uh, globally. It's just made a lot of money for people who make those vaccines. And the vaccines are frequently, which is part of why I was so skeptical about these vaccines, is it's famous in uh, medical circles that the vaccine efficacy that's touted by the trials that are run are usually 90-95%. And some years, the actual real world efficacy is as low as 3%. And it can vary by geography. Um, so if you, if you don't need those vaccines, and instead you can help people by uh, making sure their immune system just worked properly in the first place, that obviously is going to take a, lot, a huge industry out. Uh, and I think that's why we're seeing some nefarious behavior trying to suppress vitamin D messages. And, and those those actions have been going on for a very long time. I've, I came into this uh, March 2020, but I'm in touch, as is Linda, with people who've been campaigning for more than a decade and failing to get the message uh, through for some reason. And there's yeah, so a lot of so assumptions think... in that community that it, it's because if people really knew the vitamin D worked, then many medicines would suddenly be under threat because it, it affects so many different diseases. It's not just COVID, it's cancers, it's you know, all sorts of uh, autoimmune diseases, psoriasis, asthma, eczema, name a disease, it's probably something to do with vitamin D. 